All right, ladies and gentlemen, if all, you, if all of you can rise, please. Color Guard, present arms. Rob, Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Born and unborn. <laughs> Color guard, retire, arms. Detail. All right. Peace. Hello, Now for our opening prayer, I'd like to invite Bill O'Neill, former County Executive of Dutchess County, to come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and thank you for uh, inviting me to offer this prayer at uh, this morning's lunch. Uh, as you know, I am the uh, Dutchess County Executive. Uh, but I'm also an assistant pastor at the uh, Calvary Chapel of Hudson Valley. So that makes me a politician and a preacher, which some might consider a deadly combination when it comes to brevity. But uh, I promise I'm going to keep these remarks short. I did think it was very important to comment on what is happening in our state, country, and world as it relates to what we need to be praying for and what we need to be focused on. Because let's face it, our world is illogical, our country is in turmoil, and our state, well, it's somewhat insane. And as conservatives, we're fighting a good fight, but we have formidable opposition, and that's why we need prayer. We need divine intervention and assistance to counter the liberal, progressive, woke ideology that is so prevalent in our society today. And we are facing attacks on our family units, the sanctity of human life, fairness in economic infrastructure, and even the right to free speech itself. Unfortunately, the scales are tipped because the mainstream media has put not only their thumb on the scale, but their entire weight. And our foreign policy seems to be supporting global terrorism rather than taking actions to suppress it. From border policy to energy policy to international decisions regarding our allies, who are our allies and who are our enemies, we are headed in the wrong direction. And we are approaching the anniversary of the horrific atrocities inflicted on Israel last October 7th. And there are still over 100 hostages believed to be in Hamas's hands, seven of whom are Americans. And Washington continues to spend trillions of dollars that we don't have with questionable results. So I don't pretend to have the answers, but I truly believe that God does. And if we seek his help and his guidance, his divine intervention, God is faithful and he will respond. And so we need to pray, but without hate and without animosity, without a desire for revenge. Jesus Christ said, he tells us to love one another, to love our enemies, and to pray for our enemies. Now I know that sounds radical, and maybe even some source material for Saturday Night Live skits, but we love our enemies by praying for them, and praying for their change, that God will open their eyes, make them see the error of their ways, and if they do, we can achieve the peace that we seek and the logic and fairness that we are hoping for. Now, we know that mass repentance is not going to happen, and many will hold fast to their beliefs, as twisted as they are, but then we must remember that God has said, vengeance is mine. He will deal with them in his own way in his own time. That said, 
We are not called to meekly accept injustice or wrongdoing. We can and must defend ourselves as we see the state of Israel doing. And sometimes the best defense is a good offense. And the answer is to eliminate the threat. Now domestically, we can do the same thing. We can eliminate the threat of our well-being through the ballot box, winning the necessary votes. And God can intervene in that sense as well by changing hearts and directing minds and supporting what is good, right, and noble. And so, I ask you to please allow me to offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, creator of the universe, who sees all, who knows all, and has all power, we ask you to empower us to be strong and courageous, to speak out for what is good and fair and right. We ask you, dear Lord, to bless our efforts to change hearts and minds concerning human rights, family rights, and individual rights. And Lord, help our leaders at all levels of government to govern according to your principles. Put your anointed leaders in place, Lord, and let all people take seriously the right and the responsibility to vote, and let it be in accordance with your commands and your holy word. And Lord, help Israel to repel the attacks against her and to judiciously pursue those who seek to harm her people and destroy their very existence and deal with her enemies accordingly. Help us to resist the terrorists and to replace evil with good. Lord, we ask for your grace and mercy for those that have been affected by the recent storms in the southern states. Bless the first responders and all the help teams. Give them all strength and courage to endure. And Lord, bless this event this morning. Be with our speakers. Bless our time together. And may you protect and propel the efforts of the Dutchess County Conservative Party. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one last thing, uh, Don had asked if we could get a rabbi or a, a Jewish uh, representative to speak today, and we thought we had one, uh, a good friend of mine, Jonah Ritter, who is uh, not only a, a, uh, a biblical uh, genius when it comes to the Old Testament, but he's also become a Messianic Jew. Uh, he couldn't make it this morning, but he sent me this brief uh, prayer, and uh, I'll read it to you, uh, and then we'll close. Adonai, God whose spirit is in all creatures, we pray that your spirit be awakened within all the inhabitants of our land, uproot from our hearts hatred and malice, jealousy and strife, plant love and companionship, peace and friendship among the many peoples and faiths who dwell in our nation. Amen. Thanks, Thanks Barbara. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Have a seat. Unless you want to stand for me, it's okay. I'm going to kind of move this along here. I'm not going to say much. I'm going to let my speech be for others. I'd like to thank my executive committee. They were over here, sitting over here, my executive committee, for really putting this thing together. My officers, my committeemen over here, and also invited guests from Wayne County. My friend Steve Gallagher came down from Wayne County. Steve, vice president, vice chairman of the uh, Wayne County Conservative Party. Another person very close to me is uh, my buddy John Champoli, attorney. I like to go through everybody but I'm not going to be able to hit you. I will do my best. Sue Serino, County Executive. <laughs> Rob Rollison, State Senator. <laughs> Willie Truitt's here, County Legislative Chairman. <laughs> Who put on a really good uh, breakfast the other day. We had uh, Steve Scalise come up. And I'm telling everyone, I made a new friend with this guy because I saw him three different times in like three days. That was a nice event you put together. That was really good. Um, also, Jerry Kassar, my state chairman, just came in. Over here, Jerry. Now, 
Am I leaving anyone important? Sorry. Can I have all the uh, super supervisors from each town rise, please? So I'd have to say all your names. Tell everybody who you are. Go around the room. Start over here. <laughs> Any other town supervisors? Here you go. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for doing it that way. It saves me a lot of time. I'm, I'm behind the eight ball up here. And I hate billiards, you know, so. Anyway, uh, Mike Saprione is here. He's running for U.S. Senate. Mike, where are you? Come on up for a second, Mike. I'm going to try to let some people say a couple of words up here, but you have to understand I am strapped for time. I'm a half hour behind schedule, so you'll have to bear with me, okay? Mike. Thank you, Jim. All right. Well, thank you, Jim, and great to be up here in Dutchess with the conservatives, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come here. I'll be very brief. Some of you say, I don't know you. I never even heard about you. Who are you? Well, I've been out here in the, hitting all 62 counties for the last eight months. I'm Mike Sapricone, retired New York City detective. I own the small business with over 800 employees in North America for the last 30 years. My wife's a sitting Supreme Court Justice in Nassau County. I have five grown children and five uh, grandchildren. But what it's about, it's about common sense. And that's what we have to start doing again. Getting back to reality. We all know what the issues are. The issues are basic. They're crime. They're illegal immigration, which ties together. That's the domino effect. And it's the cost of living. I'm sure, Chairman, when you look at what you paid for this dinner four years ago and what you're paying for today, is a big difference. And that's what we have to understand. Every time we go to the store, every time we go to try to buy something, every time we try to send our children to school, it's costing us more than it cost four years ago. The person I'm running against, you, you, some of you may have heard of it. Now, I'm this old cop guy and the commissioner will understand this when I say this. But if you put my opponent in a lineup, you can't pick her out. It's Kirsten Gillibrand. No one's seen her in the last 15 years. Every place I travel throughout this state, they all say, are you running against that guy, Chuck guy? And I say, no, it's the other one. And they say, what's his name? Well, his name is Kirsten Gillibrand, okay? But it's important that we understand, over the course of the last six, seven years, the most extreme left senator we've had is a woman against, running against Donald Trump, Kamala Harris. We would think it would be Bernie Sanders, he's number two. But number three, most liberal senator we have is Kirsten Gillibrand. Kirsten Gillibrand wants to reimagine ICE. She wants to take a look at it and see what we can do to make it better and calmer for uh, our criminals. You know, we don't realize this. I was just out at the southern border two weeks ago and I was in Israel last month, and we don't understand. It's not a human, a human rights issue down at the border. It's not about humanitarianism. It's about security. And everybody who enters this border is a threat to us right now. We want people to enter this country legally who want to be here and earn the right to be here and go with the rules. But we can't allow the over two million people we've put in here in the last three or four years. We have no idea where half of them are. If you looked at the stats last week, over 15,000 convicted murderers, over 13,000 convicted sex abusers, over 600,000 criminals who have come through this country that we can't really trace. It's important we go back to zero tolerance. It's important we understand that the people in this country need to be safe. We need to be safe. We're giving almost $5 billion a year from New York State to downstate for debit cards for the criminals to get food, shelter, education, medical benefits. What about our veterans? What about the homeless people we have in this state? What are we doing for them? We've kind of abandoned them, and we're taking care of the people that shouldn't be here. And it's coming out of our pockets. It's important. You know, it's very important that we elect Donald Trump president again as our 47th president. That's important because people say, well, when Trump was, you know, if Trump was the president, would we still be having these wars? Well, nobody can answer that, but what we can answer is when he was the president, we didn't have this happen, okay? Afghanistan started it all. We showed weakness at the most highest position we have, and it's been downhill since then. That's why you have Russia and Ukraine. That's why you have China looking at Taiwan, and that's why we have what happened in Israel one year ago tomorrow. So we need to get back to reality, 
get back to common sense. We need to get Mike Laurel back in the House of Representatives. We need to help maintain our House, and we will do that. And my seat will be the seat that changes the Senate. So when you wake up on November 6th, and I'm your senator, we'll have a Republican president and conservative president. We'll have a conservative Republican senator in the United States Senate that will turn the Senate, and we will have the majority in the House of Representatives. But we can only do it with the help of the conservative party. And I don't know if you realize how important that help is. Every year, you turn out the votes, you help more and more, and we need your support to bring common sense back. So I ask you, please vote for me. Please vote with common sense. Get out there, tell everybody to vote. That's what we need to do. God bless America, God bless New York State, and God bless all of you, and thank you so much for having me. Let's hear it from Mike, folks. Come on now, you do better than that. We have to call these illegals what they are, illegal migrants. Enough with this migrant crap that you're seeing in the, in the media. They're illegal. I called them out on it at a press conference last year, and a reporter from Channel 7 came to me to interview me. You called them by what they are? See, yeah, they are illegal. They put me on the 7 o'clock news that night, you know, which was really good. I outbeat Bill, because Bill had the press conference. Right, Bill? Where are you, buddy? So it's a run-on thing between me and him. The reporters came to me and wanted to know why I felt the way I do. I said, well, damn it, the hell, they're illegal. Call what they are. You know, I'm, I'm a white Italian guy. You can't say I'm a, I'm a black Jew or something like that. I'm white Italian. I am what I am. So anyway, I wanted to touch on that. Um, at Will Truitt's thing with Steve Scalise, Will got me up to speak. And I, I, this is the last thing I'm going to say here today. And I, when I speak, I don't prepare anything. My wife knows I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, and when I get to the podium, it comes out. So it did come out. And there was one part of the speech that I made which was so factual, it was scary. One night I woke up from a sleep, and I had one of those sleep machines on, you know, CPAP crap. And I found myself yelling, no effing way. I screamed at the top of my lungs in my bedroom with the sleep machine on. You know what the dream was? I remember the dream. Harris won, and it was the day after election day. That was a friggin' nightmare, folks. And if that ain't something to wake you all up and get out there, contact your friends, the gun owners. I keep on bringing up time and time and time again. How many gun owners do we have in here, legal gun owners? How many illegal gun owners? <laughs> you have to reach out to your friends. They must vote. In Dutchess County, it's 35 to 40 percent of gun owners vote. That is despicable. And when the gun owner comes up to me and starts complaining, they're going to take my guns away. First thing I say, did you vote? No, I don't want to talk to you. Because you have to get out and vote, damn it. If, you, if the gun owners vote, we're going to win. And we're going to win handsomely all over the place. Donald Trump has caught on to this thing about the gun. He shocked the hell out of me in one of his speeches. He started talking about the gun owners not voting. I said, I told Marisa, what the hell? It took everyone seven, eight years, because that's when I started this whole, this whole movement about gun owners voting. So contact your friends. If you have friends out of state, which I do all over the place, reach out to them. If you've got family members in Florida, family members, no matter where they are, reach out to them. Make sure they are voting. Don't take it for granted. They're going to vote. So do your thing. The conservative party's doing their thing. That's for damn sure. Do your thing. And let's win this damn thing. Let's crush these Democrat socialist bastards. Let's crush them, not just win. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> now I'd like to bring up, if I, don't, if I don't have this next guy come up, he's going to call me up and say, hey, you didn't introduce me. Well, Jerry Kassar, my state chairman. Jerry, come on up. He drove up from Brooklyn to be here for us. Sue, let me say hi to you first. And let me thank you all for supporting the Conservative Party. It's not easy. It's not easy in this state. It's not easy downstate in particular. But you're doing it. It helps us. It makes a difference. It helps you. I was elected to my fourth term a couple of uh, weeks ago. Don was of great assistance, as he always has. But here's my point. On that first term I was elected, the first event I spoke at was a Dutchess County Conservative Party event. It, it was held actually over in, um, 
over at um, the that other beautiful location. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to be honest with you, Dutchess County is probably the prettiest county I go to in the entire state, and I get around. So just, uh, I hope you realize how fortunate you are. It was a beautiful drive up here today from Brooklyn. But here's, here's my point. Since I was first elected, a lot has changed, and a lot has not been good that has changed in this nation and in this state. I mean, between Cuomo and Hochul, we, it, it would be difficult. It would be dis difficult to determine which was worse, if things are worse now or things are worse under Cuomo or things are going to get worse. You're a buttress here, and you stop a lot of these terrible things from coming into this county. But the problem is that it, is be, it continues to permeate around the state, and you're looking at one of the worst examples that they have come up with, the state legislature and the governor, Proposition 1, which I see the signs here for. Proposition 1 does everything we say it could do from boys and girls sports to illegal immigrants getting benefits uh, and additionally and this needs to be understood because I'm right now litigating with some other people like Nicole Maliotakis and actually the Republican National Committee against non-citizen voters. I'm not talking about illegal aliens, I'm talking about non-citizen voters of which there are hundreds, there's, there's several hundred thousand in this state that are eligible to be non-citizen voters. We're now in the Court of Appeals. If that prop wins, we lose. I'm telling you, if that prop wins, the Court of Appeals is going to rule that Local governments in places that choose to want to do it, like New York City, can give non-citizens the right to vote. So that's what this is about. It's about re-electing Mike Lawler. Why? Because when we went around, and I mean the why could be as easily as we should re-elect Mike Lawler. But let's take it to a higher level. The why is that we called ourselves the majority makers in New York State. We concluded, and I mean the GOP and conservatives, that the difference in a Democratic-controlled House of Representatives and a Republican-controlled House of Representatives were a handful of Congress members that were not expected to get elected, like Mike Lawler. So you want Mike Lawler to be reelected like I do because we like Mike. But they need Mike Lawler in San Diego. They need Mike Lawler in Bangor. They need him in every part of this country to come back so that, and I'm, you know, Don, you use colorful language. No, not me. No, you use colorful language. I'm a colorful guy. But what if we get past the colorful language and all the PC stuff in this world? Well, what about the simple fact that what he's saying is correct? So that is something why, that's a reason, an important national reason for Mike. And Al is Allison here yet? Allison Esposito? 12.30. Oh, 12.30. You even know the exact time she's going to get here. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to hold you to that. Um, Allison Esposito represents an important addition to government. I mean, you know what she stands for. Oddly enough, uh, she was the police commander in Brooklyn of the precinct next to the one I live in. Um, Allison Esposito is not just about law enforcement, she's about common sense policies. She is an individual that, once again, it's more than about Dutchess County. It's more than about parts of Ulster County, it's about the nation. And I do happen to know, is Senator Allison here? Okay, Senator. And you have a, an, an assembly uh, delegation, are you, guys, are you guys here? AJ. AJ. Well, we just did our state party ratings. We just did our state party ratings. The party chooses pieces of legislation uh, that were obviously voted on in Albany. We, uh, there were 20 bills we did in the assembly, 20 bills we did in the Senate, an overlap but not identical. You happen to have one of the most conservative delegations in the state, and you should be proud of it. Conservative Party in Dutchess County has one of the most conservative delegations in the state. And that has to come through the hard work of the legislators and the hard work of the Dutchess County Conservative Party. Actually, Phil, I noticed that you were actually out there on uh, social media uh, 
thanking people that had these ratings, and I appreciate the fact that you actually read them. So, and I hope you all well. I hope you all well, and I hope you get them out. Um, they represent a lot of work on the on behalf of the legislators and the party. I mean, there were some really dopey bills in Albany this past year, and there seems to be a lot of dopey bills that come out of Albany. And at least we're catching them enough to and having our people take the right position on those bills. Like I'm, I see. Well, Michael. Michael and I just just so we we all understand my, myself and Michael are very big Met fans. So when he was saying pray for this and pray for that, I wanted them to say pray for the Mets. But now I'm getting a pushback. I got a pushback at my table. Got, guess what? Let's just worry about a Subway Series right now, okay? Let's get a Subway Series, and then myself and Michael be praying for the Mets. All right. <laughs> but but in all in all but in all seriousness. Um, Michael, I mean, we always talk about, the, it. Just, you know, act of reality is Gillibrand goes out of her way to make sure nobody knows who she is. Because Schumer doesn't want anyone else to know that New York State has a second U.S. Senator. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. So, Michael on his own merits has, there's a million reasons why Michael on his own merits should be elected to uh, the U.S. Senate from being a businessman to being an ex-cop, to being a family guy, to actually st putting in the shoe leather to visit every part of the state multiple, multiple times. <laughs> so every time I hear all the reasons why Gillibrand should not be re-elected, I just think to myself, well, how about the 101 reasons other than why she should not be elected, why Mike should be elected? You would all, we, you, me, all New Yorkers would do well to have Michael in the United States Senate. And God willing, we will see um, a wave come this November that benefits us. So let me just take a moment or two to talk about the presidential election. And I am not, I'm not here to pre-announce something that I might happen to know, but I'm going to say enough that you'll figure it out. Towards the end of the month, an historic rally will be taking place in downstate New York, led by President Trump. And I say historic because there hasn't been a rally like this planned in New York State since 1964. It will get more than the normal attention that a presidential rally for Trump gets. It will have more of an effect on the outcome of this election than any single event. It will be in New York City, and I will say this to you, it will be at Madison Square Garden. And you will all, you will all, and you didn't hear it from me, by the way. No, and you will all, and you will all be, you will all be invited. There's 20,000 seats to fill. And it is, it, the intent there, the intent there, I know, is to, you know the, the person who has never given up on New York State? The actual person who has never given up on New York State is possibly the first person the world would think would have given up, the actual candidate. President Trump has not given up on New York State. President Trump has not given up on the Northeast. President Trump wants to be helping Lawler and D'Esposito and everyone downstate New York. He wants a U.S. Senator from New Jersey. He wants to pick up a congressional seat in New Jersey. And he knows those western county, excuse me, those eastern counties of Pennsylvania, Bucks County, Delaware County, and you know them too. He knows that those counties can and will vote Republican in large numbers, pushing back the city of Philadelphia. And what would be better than within the driving range of many sports fans and other people from eastern Pennsylvania, what would be better than giving them an opportunity to see him in Madison Square Garden? Exactly. It will be big. It will be historic. And we will never forget it. The last one was 1964, by the way, with Goldwater. So, that's all I really got to say. <laughs> I'm glad to make the trip. I, um, I'm glad it was earlier because I'm going to be home for that 4 o'clock start on that game, by the way. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you all for supporting the party. Jerry and I became uh, pretty good friends. 
where we're not shy about calling each other out a little bit on the telephone and having lively hour conversations. That's the advantage we have as, as having a, a chairman like Jerry. He's reachable. My guys have his number, Phil has his number. He's very approachable, very reachable. And that's very, very, very important. I try to be the same way, but I have, I have uh, banker's hours. I'm gonna put it on my Facebook account. I'm done at five o'clock from now on. <laughs> anyway, I'm just gonna announce some people, go around the room. AJ, our assemblyman. <laughs> we have a member of the Wapiso Central School Board, Virgil Capillary. My ally to the west in Ulster County, Jack Hayes, who's also running for assembly. Jack, my man. Uh, who else we got here? Oh, Grace, my ally over right across the river, Grace White, chairman of the Orange County Conservative Party. We become very close, Grace, and I'm really glad we have. We're on a page with a lot of stuff. Thank you. Thank you for being my friend. Um, the Grace Bible Church is going to be hosting a Moms for Liberty informational meeting about Prop 1 and the ways to get involved to defeat it. It's on Tuesday, October 8th at 7 p.m., Grace Bible Church on Myers Corners Road in Wapiter Falls, New York. You'll see it on our Facebook page also, okay? I, I, can't, I don't have time to go through all our sponsors. Please, you know who you are. And I thank you from the bottom of your heart for, for being with us, helping us spread the message. Because without that, we can't go around New York State. I can't travel to certain areas and spread the message. Dutchess County is the diamond. We are it out there. Everybody looks at Dutchess County. Jerry's right. They all like a Dutchess County. So we're doing something right here, folks. Let's just keep on doing it, OK? Keep on doing it. Did I forget anybody else? I got him. I got Gallagher already. Sally Hogan. We got Sally Hogan over here from Albany County now. A friend of the Conservative Party. Bunch of county legislators. Oh, yeah. All the legislators, you want to stand up. I think they know who you are. You know, you stand up and introduce yourself, knock yourself out, but I'm not going to go through all the names. <coughs> the county legislators. And I, I want you to know I saved you guys because my executive committee wanted to charge you more to come to this because of the raise you took. <laughs> and I told them, no, we can't do that to them. Not this time. <laughs> Mary Kay and Doug McCool sitting at my table. Our county comptroller, Greg Pulver. Oh yeah, we're gonna get him. <laughs> How can I forget Greg? I was gonna get to him. It's Greg with two G's. Greg Palmer, where are you? Stand up, please. Okay, I think I covered candidates that I can get to. I don't want to go any further down the pike. We have Republican chairman here. Can you please stand up, Republican chairman? Mike McCormick. And you have town chairman. Please stand up. Please stand up. There you go. We do our best. Oh, where's Pat? Oh, Pat's sitting at my table, for Christ's sakes. I said, Pat Sheehan. <laughs> He's got signs up here. He's running for Senate. What a worker this guy is. He's all over the place, you know? He sings, too, but I don't have time to let him do it. Um, He's going to be the singing senator. That's what he's going to be up there. He has a, you know, you remember Joe Feeney on that program, Lawrence Welk? That's him. He has that voice, that Irish voice. Thank you for coming. Um, I think we're going to be ready to eat in a little bit. Please, once again, forgive me if I didn't get to everybody. I wanted to, but we're, we're a half hour behind schedule. And I want everything to go smooth because you guys have to get out and campaign today. Right? All right. Thank you very much. We'll be, we'll be back in about a half hour with uh, Brianna. There's, a, there's other people I'd like to thank, if you don't mind. Brad Kendall's here. Brad, you want to stand up? Say hello to everybody. And being that long, clerks, how many town clerks do we have here? How many town clerks? Stand up, town clerks, please stand up. Here we go. 
They're the backbone of the towns. And also we have Tracy McKinsey, she's here. She's running for judge, Tracy. And we have me, I'm Don. I gotta, you know, I gotta get a plug in, you know? There's another person I, I really like to thank. And because of her, I decided to be chairman four years ago. I was drafted into this position to be chairman. I never wanted to be chairman. Those of you, Brad knows, he knows the history. Doug McCool knows the history. I never really wanted to be chairman. They needed me to be chairman, so I did it. So I had to talk with my wife, and she says, you have to do it. So you can blame my wife. If you like me or hate me, you blame Marie. She's the saint, Saint Marie, where are you? It's my wife. <laughs> we call her Saint Marie because Sean Marie, the, the former executive director of the state party, oh, about 15 years ago, said, boy, she's a saint to be married to you. So that's who she is, she's Saint Marie. Also, those of you that don't know much about the conservative party, other than you know you just uh, you get out of line, if you, if you earn it and deserve it, there was a book written I would say about 15, 16 years ago, John, Moreland's book, The History of the Conservative Party. If you want to know what it took to make this third party work in New York State, here's the history. You can find it on Amazon. George Marlin, who's a buddy of ours, is the author. I urge every one of you to give this a shot, and then you'll see where we're coming from, a lot of things and a lot of issues. It's all here. It's all here. Now. What I like to do, Ola, where's my Ola? Come on up, my Ola. Some people, you know, just first name references. You have Elton, who's supposed to be Elton John, and you know, this one, that one. Ola is Ola. She came up from Florida. She was helping the people down in Florida with all the devastation that she had. But she had to come up here and spend time with me. She's like a sister to me. I, I happen to love this girl a lot, and I call her my Ola. And she's going to do an introduction to a special guest speaker who's going to come up here and just lay a couple of words on before Brianna comes out. Ola? Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Never forget your roots, <laughs> where you're from. I love the energy. People always look at New York, wherever you are. In the state, they look at us as such a blue state, but they don't understand how red we are in upstate. And absolutely, this is the most important election. We need President Trump to win. Um, I'm so honored to be helping some of his candidates that he has endorsed uh, in Florida. And Marino out in Ohio. Um, but we definitely need to win. I love the fight in everyone. We cannot allow, as a first generation, you don't know the meaning it is to not have freedom. You hear these stories from your parents, but I appreciate my freedom. I appreciate the hard work and the ethics, the work ethic that my dad instilled in us. So to have these illegals come in and put them before our veterans, absolutely not. There's, there, the boundaries are being pushed to a point we're going to wake up in a third world country. We could not allow that to happen. It's our America. We have to fight for it every day. As I say, never give up, never give in, and just keep fighting. Um, I want to, I guess I'm going to introduce, it's so funny. So I met Bernie. I said, uh, one of my candidates, he... He uh, speaks at their events and he looks at me and goes, do you know who I am? No. You don't know who I am? No. Do you remember where you were on 9-11? Yes. Well, you should know who I am. <laughs> Bernie, come on up. Thank you. I'm going to make this quick. Um, what she did not tell you is that I was at the rally last night with the president, and she threatened me with bodily harm that if I didn't show up today, I was done. So I, I had to get here. Um, I, I'm going to say, ju I just want to make it quick. First, I didn't realize that probably 25% of this room worked for me. 
uh, in the NYPD, and, and I want to talk about them for a second. Um, like I said to Ola, where were you on September 11th? Do you remember? The people in this room, do you remember where you were? I was in my office when the first plane hit Tower 1. I was standing in front of and underneath Tower 2 when the second plane slammed through the north side of the tower. By the end of that day, I realized that we had lost 23 members of my department, 343 firefighters, and, uh, and 37 Port Authority cops. And since then, we have lost many more than died on that day as a result of illnesses. Um, so the men and women in this room uh, that worked for me, I say thank you. Thank you for being there on that day. Thank you for being there on that day. Thank you for what you did in the, in the line of duty. Um, and I want to remind everybody, uh, you know, when people ask about September 11th, you witnessed the most substantial rescue mission in the history of our country. The men and women, the first responders of New York City, took 20 to 25,000 people out of those buildings within two hours. And then they evacuated over a million people out of Manhattan into the four boroughs in upstate New Jersey. Uh, unparalleled, never happened before. I hope it never happens again, uh, but I want to thank them. Um, so a couple of comments about the election. One of the greatest parts of last night's rally, and I will tell you, I've been to many. Uh, I do a lot of surrogate work for the president. Um, I've been to numerous rallies. Last night was different. Last night wasn't just a rally, it was a memorial. It was a prayer service. <laughs> for, for those of you that watched, it was an opera. Um, and smack dab in the middle of it all, uh, the president brings up uh, Elon Musk. And Elon Musk got up, go ahead. He got up and he spoke for a number of minutes, but there was a consistent theme. And that theme was, you've got to register to vote and you have to vote. Over and over and over again, he said it. And he even mentioned, he said, look, I know I'm being repetitive. I know this is annoying, but you have no conception how important this is. And nobody, I think, nobody would know better than him because he went through this with Twitter. He went through this with X, right? He went through the censorship. He witnessed what the government had done to free speech. And by the end of his statement, he made one comment, and I said, I leaned over, um, Eric Trump uh, and, and Lara was sitting in front of me, and I leaned over to one of the guys with us. I said, that line is going to be the line of the evening. And it was. He said, if Donald Trump doesn't return to the presidency, this will be our last real election. Think about that. Think about what that means. We've got to make sure that Donald Trump wins. And when I see congregations like this, I, I have to admit, Don's, Don, <laughs> first of all, I like the way he talks better than most politicians because there's no doubt on what he means. By the time you leave, you have no, there's no doubts what he's saying. Most politicians will get up here and ramble and, uh, and you have no idea what they were talking about. This guy, you get it. Get out and vote. Um, Don, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and I just want to mention one, one other guy in the crowd that, um, you know, there's a bunch of people come up to me and they say, what do you think? How's it looking? I can tell you from inside the Trump campaign, it's looking good. Yeah! The numbers are good. The numbers are good, the polls are good, the real polls, not CNN's poll, not the nonsense polls. The real numbers are good, but I'm not worried about the numbers. I ran the investigative side of the legal team in the 2020 election. I know what happened. And there's somebody in this room that 
I believe strongly will make a tremendous difference in whether or not these people can cheat and take over the election. Finally, somebody said. Mm -hmm. Fine. Thank you. Well, listen, I, I, I can tell you, um, being where I was, I got to see, and, and I can tell you, this is, it's pretty public knowledge, I did 18 hours of depositions for Ruby Freeman. I did nine hours before the J6 committee. I did seven hours before Jack Smith. I've done deposition after deposition after interview after interview, and where did it go? Nowhere. It went nowhere. You know why? Because the president didn't do anything wrong. The president didn't do anything wrong. They stole the election. And John Sarcone's in this room right here today. He worked for the president then, and those guys weren't allowed to do what they had to do. This time, that's changed. This time, it's going to be handled differently. We can't let the election take place, certify votes when we know there's fraud, and then run into court and say, hey, we want to look at this. You know why? Because the judges will say, get the hell out of here. It's the legislator's jobs. It's the governor's job. It's the secretary of state's job. You know what? The lawyers have to get involved on the day of the election and before. On the day of the election and before. John Sarcone's doing that. There's teams of attorneys all around the country that are doing that this time. And with God's help, um, they'll be able to keep the bad votes out, let the real votes take place. If the real votes take place, Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States. Thank you. I thought I was nice when I spoke, you know. I, I'm not a politician. I know I do what politicians can't do, because I don't give a damn what they think about me, because I ain't running for office. So I'll speak for all of you guys when I talk. How's that? Good deal? Okay. <laughs> um, we also have somebody else in this room um, that he took the ride up. I believe he's down in the Bronx. He announced that he's running for, he's running against Leticia in a couple of years. Michael Henry. Come on up. I'm going to give him a couple of words up here because he did announce that he's running. Sure. Actually, I would always make a write up for the chairman. Um, last year, I was, uh, my father was in hospice and eventually passed away. And I was struggling uh, with it because I was a primary caretaker along with my mother. And I had a conversation with the chairman, and he gave me some words of wisdom and some spiritual guidance, I would say. And I'm forever grateful because it made uh, what we were dealing with a lot easier. And I also think that the conservative party plays a vital role in our state politics because it keeps in check a lot of uh, wishy-washy politicians who sometimes are afraid to stand up on issues. And when you're running for office, you learn there's two types of people that run for office. There's politicians and there's public servants. And we have way too many politicians and not enough public servants. And, and, the, last election, and the last election, we finished with about 46% against Letitia James. According to uh, Chairman Kassar, I think the AG's race, we had the highest amount of votes statewide on the conservative line, which partially was because people in the conservative party don't like Letitia James. But the reality here is this. Um, after the election, it came out that Letitia James, chief of staff, has been a sexual predator for years. And I wrote an op-ed, and a lot of people said, don't do it, don't do it. A few other um, mem uh, elected officials stepped up, Michael Lawler, Elise Stefanik. And not only is her chief of staff no longer on the state government payroll, he's now being sued and so is Letitia James personally by the lawyer that is suing Harvey Weinstein and Diddy. And I want to say this, I never, if you told me right now as I go through this state, things would be so much worse than they were two years ago, more crime, more economic despair, 150,000 migrants roaming through all parts of the state, I would have never believed it. And the drug crisis that is going on is even worse. But what we have to realize 
is this is a great state. We have everything we need. We have 100 years worth of energy under our feet in the southern tier. We have lakes, we have vineyards, we have international borders, we have the financial epicenter of the, the world's economy in New York City. The only thing we don't have is good leadership at the state and local level because the Democrats have destroyed this state. And the way that you know that we have been the symbol of bad leadership is look around. Because nobody dumped 150,000 migrants on Gretchen Whitmer's Michigan. They didn't dump them on Josh Shapiro's Pennsylvania. They didn't dump them on, on J Gavin Newsom's California. They dumped them here because they probably saw Kathy Hochul's DNC speech and seen her speech and realized that Saturday Night Live could not parody Kathy Hochul worse than she parodies herself. <laughs> and often we hear, if we don't win, we're done. If we don't win, America's finished. Where the hell are we gonna go? There's not another country we're going to, so all we could do is stay and fight the good fight. And what we need to do, I remember in 2021, when Chairman Kassar was actually, I was saying this, he was putting out signs in Chautauqua County, Southwest New York, for the, for, to fight the voting initiatives that were put up, and we won. It's not, just, it's not just voting for a governor or voting for president. You have to vote Republican or conservative down the line, and you have to make sure everybody votes no on this ballot. It's vital. If you want little girls, your little girls playing boys sport or having boys changing in the locker room with them, that's what that's gonna do. Because we don't wanna live in a country where our citizens in North Carolina are being left to drown and being told there's no money because they rolled out the bread carpet for billions of dollars to unvetted migrants who have no business being in this country. This state, this state has elected 11 presidents, 11 vice presidents, and seven presidents. And there's only been one president until November that has served two terms that were not consecutive. And it's a former governor of New York by the name of Grover Cleveland. This is the state that people used to come to for strong leadership. And if you meet a lot of the elected officials in this state, including people like Michael Lawler, Alison Esposito, who I campaigned with, we all know that New York has the talent to fix this. And I just want to leave it with one thing regarding if you really want to make a change, there's a race that a lot of people in the media are trying not to talk about, and it's Mike Sapricone. I traveled this state in 2022. I traveled with Lee Zeldin, Alison Esposito, Joe Pinion. We always had somebody. Michael does this all by himself and he's everywhere. I've seen him in Chautauqua County, Yates County, North Country, Queens, Nassau County, Ontario County. I've seen this man everywhere. I campaigned for a year and a half for Attorney General and I have never once, I've met Hochul a bunch of times, I've met Tish James a bunch of times unfortunately, I've met Chuck Schumer a bunch of times. To this day, I have never met Kirsten Gillibrand in person. Do not reward her for being your absentee senator. Do not reward her, because it's a simple choice. You could choose between retired law enforcement or a senator who's apparently decided into the, to enter into the witness protection program. Make your vote count, and please, not only make phone, call, make phone calls for people, door knock for people, Please make sure everyone knows to know, know on Prop 1 and know that many of us appreciate what you do in the Conservative Party, and I appreciate you personally, and I always will, Chairman. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. I remember that conversation we had up in Albany at the lounge. Um, that was pretty deep. And I'm, I'm glad I was able to help you, Mike. Um, on another conversation, we talk about the Prop 1 here. Um, we go up to the New York State Republican Women's Conference for the last three years we go up there. Is Lydia here? Lydia, you here? She was here. She was here. She's, on a, she's on the board up there. Now Riley, the swimmer, she was the featured speaker. And she made a comment that really hit hard to me because I have granddaughters and I got three daughters and I know what I do in this situation. <laughs> she had said, where were the men? that's supposed to be looking out for us. And Liddy was there, and I raised my hand and said, right here, babe. So my question, where are the men? Do we have them anymore, men? Do we have them? We have to protect these ladies in their sports, in their friggin' locker rooms. If anything ever happened to one of my grandkids, one of my granddaughters, 
that freak wouldn't have a leg to stand on. As a matter of fact, he'd be missing some nuts. So we have to look, we have to take care of these ladies. It's our job, men, to take care of them. And it's not a, a macho thing, it's just our job. When she said that, she really, she really touched me when she said that. And I felt compelled to do what I did. And I, I think I was the only one to raise my hand. And I said, right here, babe. And that was it. I just wanted to bring it up because prop one is up. Um, John Sarcone, okay, you want to say just two minutes of what you're doing? One minute. Then I want to bring Brianna up because she's going to kill me. Okay. Hello, everyone. And uh, this is a great event. I've enjoyed this since 1996. That's how long we've known this man. And uh, thank you, Chairman Kassar, for coming up from uh, the great state of Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> There has been an operation in place since uh, December. We've been planning this. The only thing we needed to do was to get rid of all the racks in the RNC, replace Romney's niece, get all those people out, and President Trump did it in lightning speed. Okay, it all came together in May. They raised a hundred million dollars for this operation. I'm co-chair with Juan Reyes, who worked with me together in the Trump administration, and also we were lawyers for the campaign. There are two operations. One is New York City and the two islands, and the other is everything else. I'm in charge of everything else. There are 300 volunteer lawyers that are ready to go on day <coughs> one, which is the 26th. October, right? And they're going to be going out to all of those polling locations in the, in the ratty areas where they're trying to cheat, like Ulster County. Right. Allison's got some, she's got some district there. Little town of Newburgh. And they're going to be going over into all polling locations on a daily basis. They're going to be checking in with the Democrat commissioners and they're going to let them know we're watching. And anything that comes up, any irregularity, we've got the funding in place. And we run the court if we need. We've got the best lawyer in, in New York State, John Champoli, who's standing by to, 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 lead, to lead the litigation team here in the state. So we all have to do our part, right? Yes. So if you want to get involved, right? If you want to get involved as a poll watcher, we do need, still need poll watchers. Protectthevote.com. Just go in, sign up. You'll get a link. You'll be part of our uh, Zoom meeting we're having one this week I forget which day if you're a lawyer lawyers protect the vote .com. we need you Michael Henry thank you All right. and what he failed to what he failed to mention is that he's also running for Westchester County DA good luck down there John stand a really good chance now we know everything's happening down Florida and Georgia two minutes of, uh, of, of funds that he's trying to get together to send down there. And Brianna, are you ready, baby? Okay. Just give me one minute here. I don't want to take up too much time. I know it's a rally here, and I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm William Beal. In addition to being a councilman in the town of Wabasher, I'm also the director of emergency management for Dutchess County. And in Dutchess County, we continue to monitor the impacts and devastation caused by Hurricane Helene. Uh, we were actually uh, in correspondence with the county executive this morning about this. Our local American Red Cross disaster manager, Max Sanchez, immediately deployed into the storm-affected region, and we are in regular contact with him. As of this morning, Hurricane Helene's death toll has climbed to 227. Uh, it is the deadliest hurricane to hit the U.S. mainland since Katrina in 2005. About half of the victims were in North Carolina, while dozens more were killed in Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, the damage is catastrophic and has been described as biblical. Hundreds, if not thousands, remain unaccounted for. We pray that families are reunited and friends find one another. Now, locally here in Dutchess County, the Red Hook Fire Department and the Milan Fire Department have teamed up to collect supplies and raise money for the Elks Mill Volunteer Fire Department in Tennessee. Uh, this local fire department lost all of their equipment, their apparatus, and their firehouse. You may have seen the video of one of their fire trucks being washed away upside down in the floodwaters. The chief of Red Hook, Mike Lane, is the point of contact if you'd like to assist them uh, with their endeavors. The town of Dover also kicking off a plan to do collection sites around the town. 
Supervisor Rich Eno will have information later on tonight that I believe you're going to make a video, one of the Rich Eno videos, and put out that information. I enjoy watching those Rich Eno videos. Uh, he'll have all the details there on how you can help on that side of the county. And again, we've been speaking with the county executive this morning about how we can collectively help these folks down south. The challenge is right now when we do these collections, getting these items to the people that need them most is very difficult, if not impossible, because the roads uh, no longer exist. So what can you do right now? There's a number of organizations that you can actually donate to right now. Uh, the American Red Cross, it's as simple as texting Helene to 90999. You can make a donation by doing that via text. Again, you can text Helene, H-E-L-E-N-E, -E, to 90999 or go to redcross.com. The Salvation Army, you can go to their website, they're providing relief, food service, and emotional and spiritual care, give.helpsalvationarmy.org. Also, AmeriCares is another group that uh, is providing assistance, americares.org. The North Carolina Disaster Relief Fund, you can go to the governor's page in North Carolina for details on that. And Samaritan's Purse is a faith-based organization sharing the mission of Jesus Christ to go and do likewise, responding to Hurricane Helene with emergency food, water, and aid. Go to SamaritansPurse.org for details. Thank you. And thank you also for the PA system. He was here at 10 o'clock this morning setting us up for it. Thanks, Bill. There's two fundraisers going on this week for Greg Pulver. Um, one... Uh, Sue Serino is running for tomorrow. If you want interested in that, Sue Pulver's is tomorrow night. Yep, at five o'clock in Cosmos. Okay, you got that one. And Nick, you're running one for him at Trump's uh, golf course. Trump Tuesday afternoon for a luncheon. Yes. And I'll be there. Okay, because I could just roll out of bed and just walk there <laughs> if I wanted to. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do. After this uh, young lady makes her speech, I'm going to bring Allison up here, so this way she has a little more time to speak to you. I don't like rushing, you know, these gals and guys running for office. I don't like them rushing for what they got to say. But unfortunately, today is one of those days, as you can tell by the sweat that I have going on. Now, this next speaker, she's an elections correspondent at the Federalist. She graduated from Fordham University, Fort Hum, Fort Hum University. I have a long, I got to tell you about that, that college. You know, their broadcasting uh, career is kind of, their classes down there are kind of bad. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> she, uh, she has an international political economic degree. She's been featured on Newsmax numerous times, and also in Fox, and also Fox Business and Rear Clear Politics. And also another tie to her is that when I first met her, we were talking. She's originally from Dobbs Ferry, and she kind of recognized the last name. She went to her mother and said, Don Minichino. And she said, any relative of, of Billy Minichino? I said, that's my nephew. She said, my mother dated you <laughs> in high school. So I said, boy, that made, that made me feel pretty old. So that's a little tie we got there, sweetheart, huh? That worked out good. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. This is a, this is a, a testimony that you could be young, attractive, and conservative, and kick ass. Brianna Lyman. Don conveniently forgot to mention that my mom actually went to prom with his nephew. They didn't just date. <laughs> so, uh, guys, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity or the privilege to speak with my fellow Dutchess County conservatives. You know, it's funny, I was talking to some people earlier and I was saying how nervous I was and they're like, well, don't you get nervous doing television? And I tell them honestly, no, because normally it is me and a cameraman. They send a van up to my house from Fox and I sit in the back of it and it's me by myself. But no one ever asks me if I get nervous doing speeches because if they did, I would show them how shaky my hand is right now. <laughs> So I have a few things I want to talk about today, but I thought I'd start off talking about bolognese. And I know what you're thinking, but there's a point to this. So a few years ago, a friend of mine invited me to dinner. And he said, I'm going to make a bolognese. And I was ecstatic, because not only do I love bolognese, there is nothing better than coming home from work and not having to cook your own dinner. So I get there, and he's already started cooking. He has some celery, some carrots, he adds a little wine, he adds a little basil, he adds a little paprika. I'm like, all right. He had some nutmeg, and like at this point, I'm keenly aware this man is not Italian. And he puts some thyme leaves in there, and he puts the lid on it. And we're standing there, and he whips out a bar of dark chocolate. And I am even more ecstatic, because I love dark chocolate. And by this point in my day, I felt like I deserved a real treat. And so I put my hand out, 
and instead of giving me dark chocolate, he throws it in the bowl and ace. And I think this is like a weird sick joke. So I go to fish it out and he grabs a spoon. He says, Brianna, get out of the kitchen. Go have patience. So I become very agitated because now I know I'm going to have to go home, cook an entirely separate dinner, do my own dishes, and then carry on with my evening. Needless to say, that was the best bolognese I had ever had. And what I realized at the end of the night is even though his recipe may have varied very much so from my mother and my grandmother and a lot of restaurants I'd been to, the end result was I had a bolognese, right? The flavors he added enhanced the bolognese, but it didn't change the fundamentals of the recipe. Now I want you to think of America as a bolognese, okay? We have been told for years that we are a melting pot. And I do believe that at one point in time, it was true. My mother's grandfather, so my great grandfather came from Italy, my great grandmother from Spain, and the rest of my great grandparents on her side from Poland. When they arrived to this country, they checked their Polish, Italian, and Spanish citizenship at the door. It's not that they hated it, but they wanted to be American. There was something innately special about getting to say, I'm an American. So much so that when World War II came, my great grandfather enlisted to defend America. He was fighting against his ancestral homeland, who he had far more in common with, you know, speaking on bloodlines than he did with Americans. But he fought for America because he wanted to be American. And I don't think right now, writ large for our immigration system, we can say the same thing. We have people, illegal and legal, who come here and they no longer want to assimilate to us, right? They want us to assimilate to them. Take Springfield, Ohio. 20,000 Haitians get dropped off in a small town. You have schools that are overwhelmed with students who don't speak English, so they need a translator. And who pays for those translators? All of us here do. They have hospitals and emergency services that are inundated. You have domestic workers who are being displaced by migrant workers. And the thing is, is they'll tell you, well, this is no big deal. But it is a big deal, because I read a piece in the Cincinnati Inquirer, and it was a wonderful op-ed by a man who says that he goes into a grocery store in Springfield, and there'll be five or six Haitians standing in an aisle, and he tries to pass by, but they don't move. Why don't they move? Because they're not a familiar with American common courtesies, our culture, right? Our culture says, step aside, it's a courtesy. The best part is he says, excuse me, they don't speak English, so they don't move. And so he's forced to go around the entire grocery store to get where he needs to get. He is forced to acquiesce to these people rather than the other way around. Because the thing is, when they're coming to America, and I'm talking about Haitians in particular right now because that's obviously very topical, they're not checking their culture and their citizenship at the door. They're not coming here because they want to be American. They're coming here because they want to bring their culture here. If you love your Haitian culture, amazing. Go love it in Haiti, right? And when you put thousands of migrants in small towns, you are diluting American towns. You are inherently making it less American. But immigration without assimilation is colonization, right? And New York is particularly a big issue. We have a terrible migrant crisis, right? You have migrants, illegal immigrants, I should say, who beat up police officers and then are back out on the street. They get paid by you and I to have food, clothing, housing, and then they go pickpocket tourists so that nobody wants to come here. And Prop 1, which we've been speaking about, one of the things it would do is it makes national origin a protected class. That means that in New York City, the right to shelter decree would be construed to give illegal immigrants the right to shelter because they're a protected class. But just because your two feet are planted on American soil does not entitle you to the benefits of America or to the benefits of being an American citizen. America is for Americans. And, and here's the thing. Being American is more than just being part of a tax base, right? It's more than having a sheet that says you have temporary protected status. Being American, being part of America, means something, right? It means that you value independence. You value self-help. You value small government. You value helping your neighbors, right? You reject things like globalism. George Washington, during his farewell address, he said, the name of America, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation. Being America means sharing common purpose, common values, a common language, right? You share similar goals with your fellow Americans. 
America and Americanism is not just an idea, it is a reality and we live it every single day. And I normally would not invoke FDR because I think he is the worst if not top three worst presidents. But he did say in 1943, he says, Americanism is not and never was a matter of race or ancestry. And it's true. America is open for anyone who wants to be American, right? You could be born in France and be American, born in China and be American. You just have to be able to commit yourself to our values like liberty, equality, uh, patriotism. You have to want to assimilate to us, right? And the reason that there is such a high premium on getting to say I'm American is because it's a badge of honor, right? It's a powerful identity that you can say I'm an American. People would kill to be in our positions. And to be a citizen of America has its own profound meaning too, right? It means that you belong to a nation that cares about you, that wants to see you do well, because if you succeed, everyone else succeeds, right? And part of that means that we need to reject things like globalism, right? Politicians who tell you that we are the World Bank, because if you don't, you end up in a position like we are in today. We have politicians on both sides of the aisle who send our hard-earned tax dollars to defend our democratic allies in Taiwan, Ukraine, Israel. Our politicians are shipping billion dollars overseas to fight wars that are not ours, with money that is not theirs, to help people who are not us. We sent $320 million to Gaza this year to build a pier that sank in six days. On Friday, Kamala Harris announced we're sending $157 million to Lebanon to feed them, to give them water, to give them shelter. I just, I looked at the map. I don't know what part of North Carolina that Lebanon is in, right? This is the type of stuff that we call treason. This is treasonous acts by the current administration and by people on both sides of the aisle in Congress. We have stranded, starving, missing, dead bodies. People who are running out of oxygen. They rescued an 11 day old baby recently from North Carolina. And what is our government doing? They are spitting in the faces of our fellow Americans. After a lifetime of paying your taxes diligently, right? You don't want the IRS to come after you. We're left to hear that FEMA has no more money for Americans, but they're gonna give you $750. And in today's economy, that's gonna get you what, like a week and a half of groceries? But they'll get $750. And I'm not saying that we need the government to take care of us, because it's, it is more than evident that we are capable. You have veterans, you have congressmen from Florida going to North Carolina, we have pilots. I, I mean, I, I didn't even know this was still a thing. There are people with pack mules going to North Carolina to deliver supplies with a trail of mules behind them, right? Americans are more than capable of helping their fellow Americans. We don't need the government. And on that flip side, they don't need our taxes because our taxes would be better spent reinvesting in our community, giving monies that pilots and veterans can go help fellow Americans when their government says, screw you. A government that has enough money to send money to countries around the world but not our own people is a government with too much taxing power. And our politicians will tell us that it is in our best interest to defend Ukraine and Lebanon and what have you. How is it in my best interest to send money to Lebanon to feed Lebanese people if I can't eat something myself? You know what's in our best interest? It's helping the mom and pop shops of Main Street, right? It is making sure that hundreds of people in North Carolina will have a place to stay for the next few weeks because their houses are gone. Being in our best interest is making sure that young children have food on their table and food in their stomachs so that when they go to school the next day, they can concentrate. And when they concentrate, they get good grades. And when you get good grades, you go on to get a good education, you get a degree, you get a job, and you reinvest in your communities. That is called investing in America. That is what is supposed to be done. And you know, <laughs> yes, thank you. You know, our government cannot rescue stranded North Carolinians, but fellow Americans can. Our government couldn't even get astronauts out of space, but a private entrepreneur, Elon Musk, can. But you know what our government can't do that I don't think average Americans can do? It is rescue American hostages. Tomorrow is one year since a terrorist organization of radical Islamists who have support right here in this country from people who are supposed to be on our side slaughtered more than a thousand people. They kidnapped hundreds of people, they raped young women, and they have tortured dozens of others, and they haven't relented. Every day it's a rocket attack. I have friends in Israel. Every day they are taking shelter. Hirsch Goldberg Poland was an American citizen. 
He was born in California. He lived here until he was eight. His parents were American citizens. His siblings are American citizens. And on October 7th, he had his arm blown off. He was taken to a tunnel in Gaza. And for almost a year, he survived. He survived with no food, no water, no sunlight. And he was so close to being rescued. And he was found murdered, execution style, to the back of his head in a tunnel in Gaza. When I say it means something to be American and to be a citizen of America, it used to mean that if you were stuck somewhere in the other, across the country and you needed help, your government was going to come help you. We had your back. And that is not the reality anymore. And part of that is because we have a weak administration in office right now. They did not scare our adversaries into not wanting to do these types of things. They did not do enough to get our hostages released, American hostages. And when I say that that's something a fellow American can't do, that's one of those things that it's going to be hard for the average you know, veteran or pilot to go in there and rescue hostages. And so Hirsch Goldberg Poland would have been 24 this week, but he's not. He's going to be forever 23. There are still American hostages that could be rescued, and there is still a lot of work that can be done to rescue those hostages. We have a country that no longer knows what it means to be American, what it means to be a citizen of America, and the value that that should carry. This is not the country that our founders fought for. And I, I spoke about my mom's side of the family earlier. I just want to give a shout out to my dad. I recently found out I am the descendant not only of pilgrims, but of Revolutionary War heroes. Uh, and if you know me, I am ecstatic about that because I love history. And what I realized is that when my literal forefathers enlisted, they were signing their life away to enlist because anything less than total victory was death for treason. But they signed up anyway. They enlisted to create America because the promise of America was so important to them and worth risking their lives for. Their service should not be made in vain. The same service of our servicemen and women for the past 200 plus years should not be made in vain. America, yes, America is very much still worth fighting for. And I'm almost done, Don, I promise. I want to quote Thomas Paine, though. He said, the present state of America is truly alarming to every man who is capable of reflection. There are not only no true words that have been spoken, but I would I bet money that Thomas Paine did not anticipate that a country founded on the principles of which he wrote about would somehow devolve into what we are living in now. And that the times right now could be so alarming, they may very well rival 1776. The present state is alarming. And I say that to say that not all hope is lost, right? You can go out in less than a month from now and vote down ballot conservative. We have wonderful conservative candidates on the ticket. Conservative candidates who will fight for people like you and I, who will act not as politicians, but as public servants, their exact role and their duty. This election, I know I'm young. I haven't lived through many elections that I can remember. But it is the most consequential election, at least of my lifetime, and I'd argue everyone here. There is more than just having a Republican in office or a Democrat in office. There is liberty and freedom. The First Amendment, specifically, is on the line. Lawfare prosecutions are on the line. Donald Trump is almost going to be thrown in jail. There's a chance he could be thrown in jail. Steve Bannon sits in a jail in Connecticut. Peter Navarro went to jail. All done by the party of democracy. There is so much on the line. So, folks, I know most of you here are registered to vote. You're going to vote your family members. I recently had to register my cousins. I was like, you're not registered? They're like, no. I was shocked. You would think in my family they'd be registered. Make sure your family's registered. Make sure your neighbors are registered and go out and vote. And if you don't think you can get to the polls on November 5th, that's fine. Get an absentee ballot, send it back. I know, they're not super secure. I write about this every single day. But if you have an option between not voting or voting absentee and having hopefully a decent chance of it getting in, vote absentee. Just vote. Don, I kept that nice and short for you. <laughs> thank, you every, thank you, everybody. She, uh, she's got the talent, guys, and she's got the fire in the gut. Hey, Luis, a, le a legal Cuban immigrant. Luis from Cusa. Now, just to move this along, Brianna, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Well, you're good. You're better. Um, I know Mike is here, and I know Allison is here. Both of you, come on up. Mike Lawler. Now, I threatened him 
to be nice to me, otherwise I'll get Steve Scalise to go after him on my behalf. <laughs> Ladies first. Go ahead. Allison Esposito. I know we're, we're quick, right? We're quick? All right, we got to do quick. Um, listen, just thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, Don, thank you for your support always. The, the other chairs that are here, I saw Grace, I saw uh, Mike, I know Jerry's here somewhere. I don't know. Oh, yeah. hi. <laughs> um, but just thank you all for your unyielding support. Uh, we are in a battle for the heart and soul of our country. And I can get up here and I do a, an hour and a half speech on everything that's going wrong in the country and how how on November 5th the silent majority is awake and we're coming for our country back. But I am going to really sum this up quickly. Um, it's good versus evil. We have lost our footing on the world stage and we are a weak nation and because of that wars are all over the world. On November 6th we're going to find out if we have low gas prices or World War III. On, uh, in addition to losing our footing there's an attack on energy, there's an attack on our children, there's an attack on our children's education, there's an attack on small businesses, there's an attack everywhere we turn on our freedoms, and it's absolutely unacceptable. The good news is there's something we can do about it. Every generation is one generation away from losing everything, right? But this is how we fight, we vote. This is going to take each and every one of us. Now you all know my background, I'm not a politician, I am a cop, I am a public servant, and that is why I am here, and that is why I ran with Lee Zeldin. But this is not a blue state. This is a red state with blue dots. And if our reds remembered that voting is not a right, it is a responsibility and an obligation, it's a very different speech I have for you today, because I'd be your lieutenant governor. This is a red state and we have to get every single person out to vote. But it's not just the candidates. It's not Mike and I. It's not Pat Sheehan and Greg Pulver and everybody else who's here who's putting themselves on the line. It's each and every one of us because we are a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So it is going to take each and every one of us. 50 years ago, Democrats and Republicans disagreed on how to get there, but the end goal was the same, and it was what's best for us, our people, and our country. Now we have far-left progressives that apologize for American exceptionalism, and we are going to stand up and usher in not a red wave, but a common sense wave, a red, white, and blue wave. Republicans, independents, and Democrats alike standing up and saying enough is enough. Now, if you can be the candidate, fantastic. If you can't, I ask you to donate to each and every one of us. If you can dig deep, dig deeper and donate. If you can't donate, get people to donate. Start talking. Talk to friends, colleagues, coworkers, Jenny down the block that you can't stand, and let them know it is not a right to vote, it is a responsibility, and everyone has to show up on or before November 5th. Each and every one of us, you have to start talking to, not at, and understand what is at stake here. But I believe if each and every one of us does everything all in, and puts everything on the line and leaves it on the field. On November 5th, we go to sleep with hope. And on November 6th, we will awake together as a united nation, concentrating more on what unites us as Americans rather than what divides us. And we will once again be able to promise our children and grandchildren what we were promised, and that is the American dream. So I thank you very much for hearing me out. I thank you for your support. And I also want to remind everybody on the 10th uh, at the, uh, the Poughkeepsie Civic Center at 7, uh, Lee Zeldin and I are going to be doing a big rally, so get everybody out. Uh, we're going to get everybody out in this election to vote, and then uh, we're going to be victorious. So thank you very much. Well, let's give it up for Allison Esposito. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here in Dutchess County. Dutchess County is about 6% of my district, but it's the strongest 6% of my district. In 2022, we got about 63% of the vote, so I know Bonnie's going to make sure we get about 70% of the vote this time. Right, Bonnie? <laughs> Look, we uh, two years ago, we made history uh, in defeating the chair of the DCCC for the first time in 42 years. But more importantly than that, we ended Nancy Pelosi's reign as Speaker of the House. <laughs> now, 
New York was vital uh, to Republicans taking back control of the House. Imagine where we would be today if Republicans did not flip the House and Democrats continued to control the White House, the Senate, and the House. It'd be an absolute disaster, and it already is. You look at the crises that we're dealing with, an affordability crisis. People can't afford to live in New York, let alone other parts of the country. Housing costs, grocery bills, rent, mortgages, energy costs, utility bills, everything is astronomically higher today than it was when Joe Biden took office. They increased spending by $5 trillion in the first two years. That's what gave us the record inflation. The crisis at our southern border, over 10 million migrants have come into the United States, most of them illegally, 90% have been released into the U.S. Even Mayor Adams is saying it's a disaster for New York City, destroying the city. The governor is saying there's no more room at the inn, yet they're spending billions of our taxpayer money to provide free housing, free health care, free clothing, free food, free education, and yet don't have any money for our seniors, our veterans, our disabled. It's disgraceful. But this is what happens when you allow radical, woke ideology to govern. It's what happens when you have one party rule in New York State and New York City. You look at crime. Crime continues to be a major challenge. As we know, cashless bail was the single stupidest piece of legislation that was ever enacted into law anywhere. And yet they still support it. You look at energy. They want to shut down pipelines and natural gas and nuclear power. And yet natural gas is responsible for 70% of electricity generation. Yet they want everybody to be on electric. They want you to convert your home from gas to electric. The average homeowner would pay $35,000 to do that. People cannot afford to live here. That's why New York leads the nation in out-migration. You look at the housing crisis. We have six and a half million units underbuilt nationwide. And yet we're spending billions of dollars to house illegal immigrants. Americans cannot afford to live here. You look at the crises around the world. They have created an absolute disaster. Starting with the withdrawal in Afghanistan that resulted in the death of 13 U.S. service members. To today, Kamala Harris still has not met with the Gold Star families. To today. Has not apologized to them. Has not offered her condolences. She was invited to attend the ceremony at Arlington and didn't go. It's disgraceful. You look at what happened in the aftermath of that. Putin saw a weakness. So what did he do? Much like he did in 2014 when he invaded Crimea, he invaded Ukraine. Because he saw they had no ability to stand firm. You look at the terrorist attack on Israel. Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, other terror networks in the region. All out assault on Israel. Why? Because this administration has allowed the illicit oil trade between China and Iran to flourish. When Donald Trump was president, Iran was broke and China was on their heels. Why? Because he told China, if you purchase Iranian petroleum, we will institute a 200% tariff on every good coming out of China. So what did President Xi do? He said, okay, we're not going to purchase Iranian petroleum. Joe Biden comes in, he lifts sanctions, he allows the illicit oil trade to happen. That is what is funding the nuclear program in Tehran. That is what is funding the terrorist attacks by Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. Hamas gets 93% of its budget from Iran. 93% of its budget. And yet Joe Biden and Kamala Harris think that we need to renegotiate the Iran nuclear deal. They think we need to lift sanctions. That's why I was proud to lead the effort to pass the SHIP Act and the Iran-China Energy Sanctions Act to target this illicit oil trade and to make sure that Iran is broke and can't fund terrorism, period. 
Why does Taiwan matter? Taiwan matters because 60% of international trade goes through the Strait of Taiwan. 90% of the world's advanced semiconductors are manufactured on the island of Taiwan. Taiwan is our eighth largest trade partner. China is not our friend, they're not our ally. China, Russia, and Iran are engaged in an unholy alliance that seeks to undermine and destabilize the United States, Israel, Europe, and the free world. Now, yes, we have problems here that we have to challenge, t tackle, and we always have to put our citizens first. And yes, funds should be flowing immediately to North Carolina, to Georgia, to Florida, to help our residents. But recognize, if we shirk our responsibility around the globe, if we refuse to lead, someone else will. And it will not be to our advantage economically. It will not be to our advantage from a national security perspective. The world is in the most precarious place since World War II and the lead, lead up to the Holocaust. And Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have allowed it to happen. They have allowed these situations to spiral out of control. Now people complain about Trump. They don't like the way he says things. They don't like his mean tweets. But the reality is this. The world was safer. America was, was more prosperous. Our border was more secure. And we were more free. That is the choice in this election. My opponent, Mondaire Jones, was the third most progressive member of Congress in his one term. He rated 381st on bipartisanship. He passed one bill to rename a post office, which while a nice gesture for the individual that it's being named after, does nothing to address the challenges facing the Hudson Valley. I'm proud of my record. I've been rated the fourth most bipartisan member of Congress. I've passed over a dozen bills, five of which have been signed into law, including most recently a bill to ensure that President Trump receives the same level of Secret Service protection as Vice President Harris and President Biden, because our elections should be determined by votes at a ballot box and not by an assassin's bullet, period. I'm proud of the fact that I was able to bring back $38 million in one year of your tax money back to this district, including here in Dutchess County, funds to East Fishkill, to Pauling, to help with critical infrastructure projects, which is vital to economic development here in our communities. I'm proud of the fact that I have visited every single community in this district multiple times, including communities that hate my guts. I went and stood for three hours in Chappaqua and took every single question from the Newcastle Democratic Committee to the point by the end they were like, I actually like you more than I thought I would. <laughs> it's not that they agree with me, they don't. But we have to be willing to engage in robust debate and discussion in this country. We have to be willing to fight for our principles on the merits and fight to get legislation passed that actually matters, that actually will solve the challenges that we're facing. My opponent supports defunding the police. He supports cashless bail. He supports the Green New Deal. He supports Medicare for All. He supports open borders. He called police officers racist and white supremacist. He called ICE agents terrorists, said they were unfathomably cruel. You know what was unfathomably cruel? American citizens getting killed by illegal immigrants who were allowed to come into this country by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That's what's cruel. You know who else supports all those positions? Kamala Harris. This election is not a choice. This election is about the future of our country. This election is about the direction we want to go as a nation. We're not going to agree on everything. And by the way, that's a good thing. We don't live in a dictatorship. As Ed Koch famously said, if you agree with me on 9 out of 12 things, vote for me. If you agree with me on 12 out of 12 things, go have your head examined. <laughs> if we want to live in a dictatorship, then yes, we'll all be little lemmings and go you know, single file and just walk right off the cliff. We should have robust debate, even amongst us as conservative Republicans. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. 
So I know there are times people don't like every vote I take or something I say. That's fine. That's a good thing. But let's recognize we're all together on one team focused on preserving and protecting this constitutional republic, the greatest country in the history of the face of the earth, the greatest force for good the world has ever seen. We are fortunate to be Americans. As you know, my wife's an immigrant. She came here by herself over a decade ago in search of economic opportunity, leaving behind a former Soviet satellite state. She came here because she wanted the American dream. She wanted our children to have the American dream. My wife and I have a two-year-old daughter and one due the end of the month. As you can tell, we're very good at planning. <laughs> but that is what this is all about. That's why I'm in this fight. That's why I work tirelessly on your behalf. Because it's about us. It's about our families. It's about our future. So I will continue to fight for our community. I will continue to fight for this district. I will continue to fight for this state, and I will continue to fight for this country because there is just too much at stake to stand down or sit back. And we need your help. We are 30 days away from an election. 30 days. And this can't be the last time we see you. We need everybody knocking on doors, we need everybody making phone calls. We need everybody sending texts and emails to your friends, your family, your neighbors, Jenny down the block that you don't like. We need every single person in this room to help. Allison's seat is critical. The Democrats are spending tens of millions of dollars to try and flip these New York seats because they know the only chance Hakeem Jeffries has to be speaker is to defeat me, defeat Anthony D'Esposito, defeat Mark Molinaro, defeat Brandon Williams, defeat Nick LaLota, and prevent Allison from winning her seat. That's their path. And all of us in this room will feel terrible if come November 6th, Donald Trump is president and we lost the House. So no one can take anything for granted. Everybody needs to be part of this effort. We have a uh, rally, a GOTV rally, at 2.30 today in East Fishkill. Hopefully you can join us there and knock on some doors because this election is too critical for this to be your last stop between now and November 5th. So please, everybody, get involved. Talk to Bonnie, talk to Chairman McCormick, talk to Chairman Minichino. Get involved and help us all get across the finish line. Thank you, God bless you, and let's make sure Donald J. Trump is our 47th President of the United States. Let's hear for these two candidates, folks. Come on now, you can do better than that. Somebody came up to me earlier and said, Don, you're wearing purple. I never saw you in purple before. Let me give you a quick history of this purple thing. I wore this for my son's wedding last week, believe it or not, to match my wife's dress. So she goes to me and says, why don't you wear that to the brunch? I said, purple? Come on, my usual black or gray? She says, no, it's a purple state, New York. So here's the statement. It's a purple state. It's not a blue state. It's a purple state, and we can win it. We can do it and convert it to red. All right, so you could do it, okay? But that's the story about my purple outfit today. I think I covered all my bases. Um, we still have, how are we doing on the... Uh, the auction table. If anybody wants to auction. Auction. Yeah, the silent auction back there. You guys want to go back there and do, do your thing? Um, I think I'm covered. I think I covered everything. In closing comment, I think I just made it. Get your people out to vote. Don't take no for an answer. 
It seems that I'm always talking to the choir. I'm always preaching to the choir. I want some of these freak Democrats to start talking to me to try so, so I can convince them to come on over. But they're staying away from me. I don't know if they're scared of me or what. They see me in a, the former chairman pulled a Medusa once. My son is a real estate guy, and this is a true story. And he had to go look at a piece of property in Poughkeepsie. And uh, my wife calls me up on a cell phone. I'm coming back from a meeting. And she says, you got to talk to Donnie. He, something happened to him today. Well, what happened? He says, well, he went to look at a property. And unfortunately, it was the county Democrat headquarters in Poughkeepsie. And when the lady found out his name, she's the former chairman now, she pulled the Medusa. You know, the hair went up and she went crazy. I know who you are. Your father's the chairman of the Republican Party. And blah, blah, blah. She started going crazy. But my son calmly says, no, he's chairman of the Dutchess County Conservative Party. <laughs> so listen, they are scared of me. I welcome their challenge. Any wokeness, crazy asses want to come and see me? I'll give you a phone number. Come and see me. Come and talk to me. But I don't think they will. On that note, I'd like to have a closing prayer. I'm going to have Linda come up here and do a closing prayer for us. If you don't mind, Linda's uh, our Madam Secretary. This is impromptu, folks. <laughs> okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, so much that we are so blessed to live in the United States of America during the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century. Please let your Holy Spirit bless this land and bless the heart of every single individual here because we want it to be a beacon for the world to understand that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we ask this in your mighty, matchless, precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Okay. On that, I know you got a lot of campaigning to do. Get out. Bonnie, where, where in East Fishkill are they meeting? She doesn't know. Just go down to East Fishkill. You only have 52 square miles to look for them. You'll find them. Thank you all for coming. God bless you all.